This is the Free Hill Life Podcast number 23. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Hill Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. Here we are, and it's May, and we're starting to head into spring. So hopefully that eases some of the pain about some of us not being able to ski the last couple months. Uh, I don't know if it will, but at least we can rejoice in the fact that another winter is closer to us in the northern hemisphere as uh, we start to head into summer. So I know uh, I probably should get some news for Australia, New Zealand, and South America. Uh, It seems like I saw somebody was talking about possibly being open. I think it was an Australian one. I'll have to double check that. That's probably some good info to start sharing with you guys. And uh, for those that are down in those zones... I know uh, there's a good telly scene in Australia and New Zealand for sure. And there's definitely some in Chile and Argentina. So hopefully you guys are going to be able to get some in uh, the coming winter. Uh, Not a lot of news items as usual. (laughs) It's been kind of thin the last couple of weeks. But uh, I know yesterday was kind of an online celebration of the black shoes, which are some of our friends in France and specifically they hold that festival, uh, in teen. And, uh, we lost a good friend of ours, Kanar, who was the organizer of the black shoes, uh, not too long ago. And it was pretty cool to see people getting online on, I know on Facebook, they were doing kind of an homage uh, to Kanar and all the wonderful work he did for almost 30 years of putting on that telemark festival. And there's so many other great people that are there. That is another one. Often people are writing in saying, you know, talk more about these festivals. And I think we'll definitely do that. Uh, I was thinking about even getting kind of the FHL crew and we could talk about, uh, our experience going to black shoes in 2017. So maybe in an upcoming episode, we'll do that. But that is an amazing one with an amazing spirit like many of the other Telemark festivals around the world. Uh, Another one that's going to be missed this year, Telemark only, uh, that's in Switzerland. Another great festival that is uh, worth going to. And it generally falls on the weekend after Black Shoes. So if you like, if you have some time and you can link up a couple weekends in Europe, uh, that's a good one to look forward to as well. That one is held at Shiltorn, and I, uh, I definitely want um, Paul Fluke is the guy that's putting that one on. Uh, I know we've talked about getting him on the podcast. That would be a really fun one to have because basically they closed down the resort, and then the week later they rent the place out, and you're only allowed to go skiing there if you're a Telemark skier. So it's pretty pretty radical and good times. It's also at Shiltorn. And if you've ever seen any of the old James Bond movies, uh, correct me if I'm wrong out there, but, uh, and I don't have the guy's name. I probably should look it up, but there, it wasn't Sean Connery and it wasn't, uh, oh man, now I'm blanking on the old name. I probably should look it up, (laughs) but it was like one James Bond that, uh, was not, he was only in that particular film and you'll recognize it because there's a rotating, uh, restaurant at the top of the mountain at the top of Shiltorn. And it's pretty crazy. So imagine a rotating restaurant where it's like cylindrical and it moves while you're dining and it's pretty wild, but the skiing's awesome and the vistas are pretty amazing. So that's one, another one in Europe to keep in mind. So I'm sure we'll, we'll drum up some of those festival organizers and talk to those, talk to those guys about how they came up with these, these awesome ideas. I think that's, this year was supposed to be, I think year five or six. So it's, it's going strong and uh, shout out to another April one that did not happen this year in Sun Valley, Idaho, the Hawaiian nationals. Sun Valley Telly, another uh, great event. And the one that I believe probably is one of the oldest uh, 
kind of gathering festivals that's still going on. Again, part of doing this podcast, I think it's going to be good because historically it's going to kind of put some things in perspective of uh, we might actually have to start documenting who who's done what and how long it's been going for and whatnot. I think uh, traditionally we haven't kept great track of that as a collective unit uh, of free heel skiers around the globe. So maybe this will be a good chance for us to celebrate things in a way like that. Cause I always like to tell people about them and they're always fun to go to and you meet awesome people. So I will look forward to getting back to going to some of my favorite telemark festivals around the globe in the future. And I hope all of you guys are staying safe out there, staying healthy and all the good stuff. So today's episode is going to be kind of a, uh, a quicker one. And, oh, I wanted to say too, before I start this one, I have some amazing guests coming up. And part of why this one's kind of short is told, in total honesty, kind of had a hard time. Uh, we've been, I've been trying to kind of tie things up at the shop here and get ready for spring, summer mode. Make sure we've got things squared away. But in the process, I've got some amazing uh, people that are going to be coming on and I've got kind of uh, a list of guests that are going to be starting to come on the show in the future. So the coming weeks, get stoked so you don't have to listen to my solo voice coming from Salt Lake City, Utah all the time. But I enjoy it either way, talking to people, doing this, whatnot. But today's episode, what I thought I would do is I feel like, and this is what's kind of hard about doing this sometimes is there's such a wide variety of people that are listening to this, at least from what I can tell so far. And some of them have been telemarketers for a long time. And I think one thing that I've noticed though, in doing this and having the shop, there's a lot of beginners and We've kind of, I'm saying we, I'm dragging you guys all into this with me. We've all done not as great a job as we could have with beginners because there's not a lot of beginner information out there (laughs) and we just got to do a better job. So come along with me, everyone, and let's try to do a better job. I know we're really good at accepting people when they show up, but I feel like getting into this, into telemark sometimes is... (laughs) It's like there's kind of a barrier there. Um, It's hard to figure it out sometimes. And so today I thought this would be kind of a fun. I wanted it. I've been thinking about doing this for a while and I think I'll probably do a video glossary at some point because I think some of some things definitely need a visual look to them. But today I thought I'd do a fun one. Uh, Ten keywords and phrases for every beginner telemark skier. And the reason I wanted to do this podcast was uh, to have at least one documented place where a newbie can find some answers to what is being spoken about. Um, Like I said, this podcast has kind of helped me realize how often beginners are left out of the conversation uh, merely because of verbiage or slang or what have you. Um, so if, if you're a beginner and you're just getting into this and you literally, maybe you even just found the word telemark or you saw a picture of someone, you're like, what's that? This one is for you. <clears throat> and if you're one of the old crusties, uh, you might find something useful too. Who knows? So <clears throat> it'll be a good refresher. And honestly, I, as I was doing this, it kind of makes me realize one, some stuff is has changed over the years and is not as relevant, but is still spoken about. And, um, two, oftentimes we are, we are all saying different things about the same piece of equipment or whatnot. So this is, this is one man's opinion (laughs) on maybe what, what we settle on out there. Um, I'm going to kick this one off with one of my favorites because I guess I'm getting old enough that I'm, I'm old school 
But I have always thought this is a fantastic word. And maybe it's because I'm a Ramones fan and there's a song named after this. And maybe it's because I got a sticker from Neptune Mountaineering when I was a kid. I literally drove all the way to Boulder, Colorado to get a sticker because it said this on it. But that is word number one, pinhead. And pinhead, if you hear this word in a telemark skiers vernacular, pinhead is an endearing term for a telemark skier. It's it's a it's a word that came uh, from the Latin root uh, pinheadus powderus maximus. And I'm totally kidding. And that's a bunch of BS. So uh, the the actual root of this word pinhead comes from a three pin binding. So when Telemark, and you guys hear this, like when we talk to history guys and people back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, we were using three pin bindings. And somewhere along the line, I, I'm not sure where the term was coined. So if you know the origin of the word pinhead, please let me know. I would love to know that. But I would assume it was probably somewhere in Colorado, to be honest with you. Uh, somewhere there or New England. Those are my two guesses. Um, but basically, if you hear the word pinhead, it's basically referring to uh, those three pin bindings. And if you look at a three pin binding, if you've never seen these old Nordic bindings that were used for telemark in the late seventies, early eighties. And we obviously still have them today. There are three pins that are kind of like these little metal pin looking things or, or little miniature, um, almost like a, a cylinder, but very thin. It's, it's definitely more like an, like a pin. And these pins are part of the toe plate of the binding. And then in leather boots back then, you had three holes that coincided with the pins. And so what you would do is you would push your toe into the front of the binding until the pins met the holes and would go inside the holes. And that would secure your boot to a certain extent so that it wouldn't shift in the binding. And then there's what we call a toe bale, which clamps the toe to the toe piece. And then, like I said, the three pins kind of help it so it doesn't shift around. And that is what a three pin binding is and hence the name pinheads. And just a reference, what I was talking about, uh, obviously you can look up the Ramon song, fantastic band. They're amazing. And, uh, but the, the sticker I was talking about was there was a sticker called that said pinheads from hell. And it had this hippie looking guy in a old school kind of telly stance carving a telly turn. And it was made by Neptune Mountaineering, which was an incredibly influential shop for early backcountry telly stuff and yeah it, it was a big deal to have that sticker but back then we didn't I don't even know I don't even know how you order stuff like that so you know I was from Utah I drove to Colorado and got a pinhead sticker uh, Neptune Mountaineering is still there I do not know if they have the stickers but Neptune Mountaineering if you're listening you should definitely make those stickers because I would love to get a new pinheads from hell sticker that'd be amazing Okay, guys, moving on. That was uh, (laughs) number one. Number two, one of the most common things that comes up in conversations, and I see people get lost all the time, and it's probably because of people like me, because I'm I'm talking to all of us weirdos out there that are into the gear, and they know what's going on. They've got this, like, long history of, of stuff. But the second word is... 75 millimeter and a lot of people have no idea what that means we start talking about you know this boot and that boot and whatever 
And it must be incredibly confusing if you hear 75 millimeter and people have no idea what you're talking about. And that happens all the time. People walk into our telemark shop. Hey, I'm looking for boots. Oh, are you looking for 75 millimeter boots? <laughs> They're probably like, what? So very basic. If you're a noob, 75 millimeter is the width measurement of the square toe of a traditional telemark boot. Okay. It's otherwise known as the Nordic norm. And the reason it's the Nordic norm is literally, I was just talking about the three pin era of bindings. Nordic bindings in the 70s, 80s, were also... 75 millimeter boots. So there was a point where there was this crossover. And so as we progressed, so the width of, you know, I talked about where the three holes are on the square toe of a telemark boot. It's also the slang of that square toe. Let it be known is a duck bill because it looks like the bill of a duck. And that 75 millimeter, 75 millimeter measurement is how much it measures across the toe on that duck bill or square toe that extends off the front of the boot. So that is the Nordic norm because that's what Nordic bindings used. And then we used Nordic bindings essentially to make telemark turns downhill. So hopefully that makes sense. And that is what 75 millimeter means. Okay. This next one is, I always thought this was an obvious one, but I, I'm going to take a stance on this, but I also am curious if someone out there can explain to me the alternative (laughs) because it often comes up and I'm not quite sure what to think about it or where it came from. Um, and that is the word bellows. This is an important one because one thing that distinguishes our boots, our plastic boots, from an alpine boot is the ability to flex at the ball of the foot. So when the Terminator boot from Scarpa came out in 1992, they put these creases on the top of the boot above the ball of the foot. So you can imagine if you put your foot flat on the, on the ground and you flex it, bring your heel up, you know, you obviously needed some sort of a crease in there. And so there's a a couple creases that go together and we call that generally, we call that the bellow, the bellow of the boot. And I always thought that was just kind of common knowledge, uh, but I think it's just because I've heard it for so long, but the bellow of the boot is how you refer to that section of the boot that looks like, uh, you know, the, uh, the, like a, (laughs) I don't even know what the word is, like a, like a bellow that you use to, you know, old school that you kind of like blow air into a, uh, a fire uh, and almost like uh, think of it like as an accordion, you know? So there's a couple creases that kind of look like an, uh, the center part of an accordion and that's referred to as the bellow. So the word that I off, I have heard and I f- feel like I hear more often now that we've got a shop, but obviously because we meet more people is people refer to it as baffles. I am baffled by that. I'm not totally sure where that comes from. And maybe a baffle. I, I, I I was, I tried to do a little internet search about this. Nothing totally came up. So I have not put a lot of research into this and it may be a regional thing, a regional dialect of bellow. Uh, it could be a translation of bellow. That, that happens kind of like we talked about, like, uh, the French call it ski shoes and we call them ski boots. Maybe it's that I'm not sure. So if you know where baffles comes from, 
maybe this is, maybe we need to have bellows and baffles as synonymous. And I just haven't, I, but I've never been able to figure that out. So this is me kind of posing that question. I am taking the stance on bellows, but for you new people out there, uh, the bellows are that section of the boot that look kind of like an accordion on Scarpa boots and also Garmont, uh, which is now Scott boots and uh, black diamond boots when they were made used more of an accordion looking bellow. Crispy boots once had kind of a reverse accordion bellow and now it's more of kind of a bubble looking Either way, we I I tend to always refer to that as the bellows. All right. You didn't know we could go that deep about bellows on the boots, did you? <laughs> That's what happens when I'm sitting by myself recording these things. So hopefully you're enjoying. Um, okay. On to number four. Binding types. So I broke these down into five categories. And honestly, I feel like this is definitely a conversation that is where a large majority of new people get lost. And I would hate for someone to get lost in a conversation like this because it just really shouldn't be that difficult. And binding types, you think it'd be like, (laughs) hey, I've got a telemark binding, but it's not quite like that. So if you're getting into telemark, or maybe you've even been into telemark. And I, I will say this. There's a lot of people who have telemarked a long time that do not know that all of these different versions exist. And that is totally okay because you have better things to do in your life than sit around and talk about all this crazy talk uh, about this. But it is it, it can get interesting and it it's good to know what the words mean in order to be able to understand that we're talking about bindings, but there's various versions of a telemark binding. So number one, we've already referred to a three pin binding. Okay. And so that is simply a toe piece. It has three pins and it, like I said, it has what we call a toe bail, which clamps down and locks the toe into place. Okay. And then those three pins make it so it can't slide. So that's the first category of telemark bindings. The second would be the cable binding. A cable binding is uh, any binding that has a cable that either goes around the back of the boot or uh, some of them have an under cable routing that goes under the foot and then attaches to usually some sort of a stirrup looking thing that then goes around the heel. But all of the cable bindings utilize some form of a cable or some hard uh, metal in place of the cable, but it's still essentially a cable binding. Okay. Um, the toe generally is just a bar that your toe, your 75 millimeter toe slides under the bar and keeps it into place. There is an exception that is a three pin cable that Volet makes, but you get the, you get the drift. The toe pieces uh, are usually just sliding the toe in there and there's a cable going around the back. So that leads me to, uh, NTN and I actually am going to break NTN down uh, a little bit later what NTN is but NTN bindings so if you hear the word NTN that is a category of binding there's also tech toe NTN and the fifth one is TTS which is telemark tech system so NTN, Tecto, and TTS all use a non-75 millimeter boot. They use an NTN boot, which I'll dig into the NTN thing here in a minute. But those three categories of bindings use a different boot 
than the first two categories. So those are our bindings. We have three pin, cable, NTN, Tecto NTN, and TTS. Okay. I don't want to go too deep into that because it could get weird, but those those are words that you're going to hear. They all refer to bindings. They all refer to telemark bindings. Some of them use different boots. So that is your cursory dive into the different types of telemark bindings. Okay, the next one that I feel like comes up often as you're learning the turn and I hear this thrown around a lot and it may not make a whole lot of sense is what we call a lead change. I think this is a good one to have in your back pocket because if you're reading somewhere and it doesn't describe what this is, uh, it doesn't, I, I hear it used, but I don't know if people explain it. A lead change is when you change your lead leg or your downhill ski, okay? So the one, when you look at a telemark turn, the, you know, we always talk about dropping knees. So the leg that's dropping the knee is your uphill ski. Your downhill ski, your foot is flat and that's called your lead ski, okay? So when you do a lead change, you are going from your downhill ski, you're coming up and unweighting, and then you're changing your lead ski. So if you have your right leg forward going in a left turn, right leg forward is downhill, and you're coming up and you're making a lead change by putting your left foot forward and changing the lead ski. So... If you're in your telemark lesson and someone says you need to do a lead change, that's what it is. It's changing the lead foot. Okay, back into the gear. This is another one. It kind of it reminds me of it reminds me of bellows and baffles. This is the words heel throw. Okay? Heel throw is generally what we consider the piece on the back of a cable binding that you flip up and it attaches. It's kind of how you snap on the cable, attach the cable to your boot. Heel throw. Now, depending on which company is selling you, said piece at back of cable binding. It might also be known as a heel lever. I think these are both acceptable because one, you're kind of throwing up a lever you're levering on. They're both kind of the same thing. But if you hear, if you, if you hear the words heel throw or heel lever, this is the part at the back of the binding cable binding that generally fits into the groove of your boot and you snap it on. So I want to point out not, this is not to be confused with heel piece, which is usually what we refer to as the part that mounts to the ski. Okay. You can see why this gets extremely confusing as to what you're talking about. So heel throw, heel lever, the part that's on the cable, heel piece is generally the part mounted on the ski. Okay. And there's even, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> no, I will. I think 22 designs calls there's a heel plate, but usually a heel piece is usually that's the way to distinguish the two. So if you need, Hey, I broke my heel lever. I broke my heel throw. That's the part on the cable. Uh, you know, if, if you broke your heel piece, it's the part mounted to the ski. Uh, so I like that one. That's a good one. That one gets mixed up a lot. Uh, going on to number seven, the... This comes up, and I did a video on our YouTube channel about this. 
And I've been thinking a lot about how to simplify this because it's such an important part of binding culture and binding explanations and the feel that we get with bindings. But I think it's going to, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly refining it. I'm trying to simplify this. And this is the active binding or neutral binding. Okay. So activity is determined by where the pivot point is on the binding. In other words, it's where the cable pivots on the binding as you flex forward. Okay. So if you go to our YouTube channel, it's under Telemark Skier Magazine. You'll find all the free life shop videos and all the Stoke videos and all the gear reviews. I talk about this because same kind of thing. People walk in a shop, you're a brand new Telemark skier. You know, what we don't want to ask you, you're going to, oh, I want to get into Telemark skiing. Oh, do you want an active or a neutral binding? I mean, come on. Nobody knows. They don't even know what it feels like. So I feel like this is like one of those things like we just, we're trying to get them into it so they have a great sensation and they get stoked on it. And, uh, but the the basics of this, and I think this was one I was a little hesitant to put in here, it probably needs more of a visual, but when you hear active, uh, active binding or activity in regards to a binding, it's just talking about how neutral it feels, like where it's engaging on the toe of the binding. And so when the cable lifts up, it's more or less where it's starting to catch and engage it basically like where the cable is routed through the toe piece determines the activity. So hopefully I can simplify that more, but just know that if, so, if you get in a conversation about activity or, you know, that kind of stuff, that's what it's referring to. Not to be confused with stiffness. Go watch the video. It talks about the difference between active bindings and stiff bindings. Okay. Number eight. We're on to one of the historical ones that kind of like number one, but this might even go back further. And I feel like especially people getting into telly, this is for those of you who have followed anything that I've done over the years, I kind of have, I kind of have my own little beef with this one, but it's, it's silly, you know, and that is the lurk and it's just such a funny word because, and actually I funny enough, I don't know if I know the history of that word per se, but I feel I'm going to give it credit is it looks kind of rad and the lurk is a staff. Okay. It's a long staff that imagine your telemark skiing with kind of like a long wizard staff or like a kayak paddle without the paddles, you know, People that know how to do this are pretty incredible. Like it looks cool. I'll give it. To, I'll give it to you. And uh, there's uh, one of the King of the Heels submissions was from Colorado, and that kid, uh, his his name's. Uh, I'm having a hard time remembering stuff tonight, <laughs> but he, he he's making these amazing lurks, and he does some really cool stuff. But the reason I've always kind of had a little beef with it is the people from Morgadal from where Telemark came from in the region of Telemark, they didn't use lurks, but whatever that's unless you're nerding out on that stuff like me, you know, it's, it's cool. But the lurk is kind of like this historical looking thing. A lot of people say, Hey, you know, they call it a staff or they call it whatever, but a lurk is just this long. If you see these telly guys, especially a lot of times at these European festivals, people bust out the lurks, big pieces of wood. Um, I always see them. The Italians have them. Um, there's some people just ripping around with these things and they're cool and they're vintage looking and I get it and it's pretty awesome. But if you hear that word, that's what they're referring to. It's a long staff. You can ski with it and some people get rad with it. Uh, kind of going back to, this is another one, and number nine is one that I think is incredibly important for you as a Telemark skier getting into Telemark to protect your new skis from getting screwed up. And number nine is cord center, okay? And 
this comes up a lot when you start talking to people about mounting your skis. Let me just remind you all out there, it is 2020. It is the year 2020. So Cord Center, we used to utilize Cord Center when we had more of these Nordic style skis. And what it refers to is essentially if you took a piece of cordage and you took the cordage tip to tail and you measured the midpoint of the cordage and then marked that on the ski, you would have cord center. Well, back in the day, it used to be that you would mount your pin line or if you drew an imaginary line across your three pins because you're a pinhead and you put those three pins on cord center, that is a lot of times how you would mount your skis. And I, I get it. You know, if you're out there and you're like, there's all sorts of variations and balance points. I mean, that's a whole nother podcast about mounting skis. I've talked a little bit about it, but this is for the newbie again, cord center. If someone in 2020 tells you, and this is where you need to be really careful, is if you live somewhere where uh, there's not a really good, knowledgeable ski tech that, and it, I'm picking on the guys because a lot of times if you walk into a shop somewhere and you just say, I want a telemark mount, or they just assume that you want a quote unquote telemark mount because you have telemark boots and a telemark binding, you want to be sure that they're not doing pins on cord center because in 2020, that will put you like three to four inches behind where the recommended mounting point is. So without going down the whole rabbit hole of mounting, the default trust the ski manufacturer go boot midsole on uh boot recommended center on the ski that's most of the time that's going to be a good thing and then once you get super tricked out and you know what you want and you want to switch things around you can get crazy but cord center is like a historical term at this point very very few applications that you're going to mount pins on cord any longer um, on a modern day ski for downhill telemark. All right. And that brings us to number 10, which I kind of talked about a little bit before, and that was NTN. And I wanted to end on something a little more modern. It is getting kind of old. We're probably, you know, we're, we're getting up there. I mean, we're talking like NTN, that acronym or abbreviation, you know, has been around for like 15 years now, but what it refers to is new telemark norm. Okay. So remember we talked about 75 millimeter being the measurement of the toe of a duck bill boot, which was the Nordic norm. Well, now if you're getting into telemark in 2020, you are going to probably be asked if you want a 75 millimeter boot or an NTN boot. NTN is new telemark norm. There is no uh, Nordic norm toe any longer. But there is a part of the boot underneath that we call the duck butt for slang. And your boot operates and connects differently to those bindings. NTN is not compatible with 75 millimeter bindings, nor the other way. Uh, at some point, I would anticipate that NTN goes away and we have telemark bindings again, but that's probably ways down the road, uh, you know, when everything moves to that platform. But for all intents and purposes, there's probably never going to be a new 75 millimeter boot or I'm sorry, 75 millimeter binding or boot made. And most things will be NTN. To you getting into it, you're probably most likely at this point, you can probably find a telemark boot and binding that is on the NTN platform. 
But if you get into that talk with somebody and there's one of my earlier podcasts is called 75 millimeter versus NTN, go listen to it. If if you're, if you've gotten past this glossary episode and you're ready to start looking into what that means so you can get all of the sweet tactical conversation to talk with the best gear nerds out there, that's a good one to get into. So, um, and that's it. NTN. So those are my top 10, you guys. Uh, top 10 glossary items that you're going to need as a beginner telemark skier. Hopefully that helps you a little bit understand better some of the verbiage that is going to get thrown around that please, I hope it never makes you feel like you're just not smart enough because this is this can be a complicated world more than it once was and there's a lot of variations on stuff and i want to encourage all you beginner telemark skiers or if you're interested in telemark and someone threw this podcast at you hopefully that will give you some fun little nuggets to put in your brain that are going to help kind of navigate the conversations that you're going to have uh maybe with shop people, or if you come in here to the free heel life and you want to talk shop that we, uh, will have similar language. And for all of you crusties out there that I was talking about, hopefully we can settle on some wonderful words that we're going to use in the future, namely baffle versus bellow and heel throw uh, versus heel lever versus everything else. <laughs> but I had a lot of fun today, guys. That was kind of fun to break down. I hope you are having a fantastic week. Uh, I really appreciate you listening. As always, how you can support us. You can always donate, uh, make a donation of your choice, paypal.me slash life. That supports all of our content, especially the podcast. You can check out freehealllife.com. Uh, we're flushing, we flush a bunch of demo skis out this week and we've got some stuff left. So keep checking that. We're just kind of getting rid of everything from the season so we can kind of start looking forward to the fall. Uh, articles, more information, telemarkskier.com. You can always email me at podcast at freehealllife.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening, you guys. And I can't wait to share some of the upcoming guests. It's going to be amazing. So be sure to tune in for that. And until next week, spread telemark always, my friends.